What does a French sounding name have to do with taking up unconjugated bilirubin? Um, I'm not really sure, but you can remember that G comes before R. And so if you remember Krigl in a jar, that's the one that's easy to remember, right? It's a very scary name, very scary condition. Dubin Johnson, easy to remember, black liver. Uh, Gilbert and Rotor, just remember that G comes before R, and you can kind of fill in the blanks here and put a G here, put a G here, and put an R all the way down here. Okay. Excellent. Very good. So let's, uh, in that case, move on. We were talking about how the receptors of our endocrine system worked. And I said, I told you that the way that our steroid hormones work is different from peptide hormones, okay? And so just refresh me, how are steroid hormones different? Why are they so unusual? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You're, you are on the right track, Natalia. Uh, so, sorry. Um, so, essentially, what we see, and even in this diagram you can see, is that rather than steroid hormones binding at the plasma membrane, this is what most things do, right? Epinephrine binds at the membrane. Um, ACTH binds at the membrane. Um, all of these hormones we're used to talking about, they bind at the membrane, and then they cause a problem inside the cell, and then they leave from their receptor. The big difference with steroid hormones is what we can see here is that they are able to just enter the cell. They just, they just freely enter the cell, they bind to this little complex, and then that complex binds directly to DNA. That's pretty abnormal, and so that's some, definitely something that you need to know for uh, step one. Okay, Steroid hormones, they're able to pass through the plasma membrane and bind to the DNA. Okay, So that's the important part. Uh, could you give me an example of a steroid hormone? Could you give me an example of a steroid hormone? So we just described this whole process. What is one of the hormones that's able to do this? Because I'll tell you right now, Natalia, the way that they're going to ask you this question on step one is they're going to say, they're going to give you a hormone, say TSH. And they're going to say TSH is able to do its action through the following. G sub S, G protein couple receptor. G sub Q, G protein coupled receptor, direct binding to the DNA, G sub I G protein coupled receptor. Okay, and so you need to know which of the hormones are able to are binding at the surface and causing a G protein coupled receptor, and which ones are directly going to bind to the DNA and cause a different problem. And you need to know that for every single one of the hormones. Okay, so steroid hormones, they're able to enter the plasma membrane. Great. What's an example of a steroid hormone? TSH is going to be a peptide hormone. So TSH will work through the G protein coupled receptors. I believe it's a G sub S G protein coupled receptor. So that will increase levels of CAMP and then you'll have the downstream effects from there. Okay, so not TSH. However, what hormone is made by TSH? TSH increases level of what hormone? That's okay. That's okay. So TSH is really just your thyroid stimulating hormone. And so TSH levels will increase your levels of, of thyroid hormone. So your T3 and T4. And lucky for us, this ties right into this slide because T3 and T4 work like steroid hormones. T3 and T4, they don't bind at the membrane. They diffuse directly into the cell. They bind to a little complex and then that complex will bind to the DNA. Okay, so T3 and T4 binds DNA. It's a steroid hormone. Okay, good. Now, uh, some other steroid hormones. Think about testosterone. Testosterone, think about estrogen. You know, all of the, 
Um, sex hormones work through this way. Testosterone, estrogen, think about cortisol. Think about aldosterone. Everything that's being made from the adrenal gland, from the adrenal cortex, I should say. So cortisol, aldosterone, androgens, those are all going to be able to diffuse into the cells and bind directly to the DNA. Okay. And what am I forgetting here? I think that's pretty much all of the hormones that we should know. So testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, aldosterone, and our androgens can all diffuse directly into the cells and bind to DNA. Okay. And so, um, you know, if you're struggling to memorize these, what I would recommend is to memorize all of the steroid hormones. If they're not in that list, then they must be G protein couple receptor type hormones. Okay. So if you see something else, ACTH, right? Uh, growth hormone, um, you know, insulin, all of these other hormones, they're not part of our steroid list. And so we know that they're binding at the cell surface. Okay. Good. Awesome. And just to let you know, I am recording today's session, so it should be available for you on YouTube if you go and check it tomorrow. If you want to rewatch any of these parts, you're free to do that. Okay. Excellent. Great. So uh, target cell specificity, a target cells, they need specific receptors to which the hormone binds. For example, ACTH receptors are only found in the adrenal cortex. Thyroxin receptors are found on nearly all cells of the body. Most cells of the body will respond to thyroid hormone. And so different cells sort of have different specificity. How do we activate those cells when we get there? So three levels are three factors are important, and this is I'm going to put a star by because this is something that gets asked about what three things are necessary for activating a target cell. So the level of the hormone in the blood is important. The number of the receptors on the cell or inside of the cell, and the affinity of binding between the receptor and the hormone. And so these are all the things that we can kind of change the levels of and see differences in the um, how, how effective our hormones are. For example, if we were to increase the level of a hormone in the blood, we would see more effect. If we increase the number of receptors on a cell or decrease the number of receptors on the cell, we would see more or less effect. And how um, whatever the affinity of that receptor to the hormone will also determine how effective that hormone is. If there's a weak affinity, it's not going to bind the receptor. If it's a strong affinity, it's going to stay stuck on that receptor and keep activating the, the cell. Hormones will actually influence the number of receptors. And so for this factor number two, uh, we have to think about upregulation and downregulation. Some cells, if you have not enough hormone, they upregulate their receptors. So we have a low level of thyroid hormone in the blood. The cells in our body are going to respond to that by increasing the number of receptors in the body, right? Now that there's less hormone around, these cells are really hungry for hormone, and so they increase the number of receptors so that uh, maybe they can catch a little bit that's going through the bloodstream. So they increase the number of receptors, okay? Now, if there's too much hormone in the blood, typically cells will respond by downregulation. So if the cells are getting overstimulated, there's too much hormone in the blood, the cells are going to respond to that. They don't like being overstimulated. They're going to respond to that by decreasing the number of receptors on their surface or inside of them, uh, inside of the cell, so that they stop being so overstimulated by this ex excessive hormone. Okay. Great. So uh, while hormones are in the blood, this is an important point. They can either be free floating in the blood or they can be bound to certain proteins. And so when you think about steroid proteins, I'm sorry, steroid hormones, you think about thyroid hormones, which work like steroid hormones because they pass into the cells and bind directly to the DNA. All of these work in the same way. These are going to be circulating in the blood on plasma proteins. And so when you have something like cortisol in the blood, Cortisol is not just going to float around by itself. Cortisol is always going to be bound to some cortisol binding protein. Okay. Whenever you have estrogen, another steroid hormone, estrogen is always going to be bound to some estrogen 
binding protein. So why is this important? Why do we care? Well, if estrogen is bound to estrogen binding protein, it can't pass into the cells. It can't have its downstream effects. Until estrogen lets go of this estrogen binding protein, the level of estrogen will be a little bit lower. Okay, So the presence of this protein effectively lowers the level of estrogen in the blood. Because if estrogen is bound to estrogen binding protein, it cannot be effective. Okay, And so let's think about our patients for a second who have liver failure. Patients with liver failure, uh, they lose the ability to synthesize many of the proteins in their blood. We're, we know this, right? We talked about it in GI. Patients with liver failure cannot synthesize proteins very well. And so some of the proteins that they're going to have trouble synthesizing include binding proteins for steroid hormones. So we have liver failure. The liver stops synthesizing this estrogen binding protein. What happens to levels of estrogen in the blood? They, they will increase because now instead of estrogen by being bound to a protein not being able to be effective, estrogen is just going to be free to float into any cell it wants and just start having its effects. Okay, And so in liver failure, what you see is levels of estrogen increase. This is what leads to that palmar erythema, the really red palms that you see in patients with liver failure. It leads to spider telangiectasia or spidery veins in the arms. Estrogen in liver failure is a big, big problem. It's not bound to its binding protein anymore, so it's really free. The levels of estrogen in the blood increase because there's no protein to bind it and um, protect it from having effects. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, excellent. So that really only goes for our steroid and thyroid hormones. All other hormones, ACTH, FSH, LH, all the peptide hormones, insulin, well, actually insulin does have proteins associated, but most other proteins are going to circulate without carriers, okay? And so the concentration of a hormone, of the circulating hormone, is the rate of release and the speed of inactivation, the speed that your body breaks it down. So hormones are going to be removed from the blood by some of the degrading enzymes in the kidneys and liver, and the half-life is the time required to decrease that hormone which we're co pretty comfortable with. So control of hormone release. Blood levels of hormones, as a rule, are going to be controlled by negative feedback systems. Okay. So when we talk about, say, um, you know, say you have a patient who, um, say you have a patient who uh, goes into a very cold environment, right? It's getting very cold up here where I live in Connecticut. And so we, we get, go into the cold. The body is going to respond to that by the hypothalamus is going to be able to detect the cold. Here's our hypothalamus up in the brain. The cold triggers that hypothalamus to release a certain hormone called TRH. TRH. Okay. TRH is going to flow down into the anterior pituitary. I'm going to put AP here for anterior pituitary. That anterior pituitary is going to release TSH. Okay. TSH. That's going to be a positive feedback. Positive. Good. And that TSH is going to go to our thyroid. Thyroid. And the thyroid is going to release our T3 and T4. T3 and T4 are going to go to the, to the tissues of the body, increase the metabolic rate, and increase body temp. Okay? Great. So we increased our body temperature after going into the cold. We did the job we wanted to do. Now, we don't want T3 and T4 hanging around anymore. Lucky for us, there's something called negative feedback. So this T3 and T4 are going to go back to the hypothalamus and cause a negative feedback. It's going to go back to the anterior pituitary, cause a negative feedback. That will ultimately cause the levels of TRH to drop, levels of TSH to drop, and then levels of T3 and T4 to drop. We already responded to the stimulus that we needed to respond to. And so the important thing here is that the idea of negative feedback. Uh, our body, most of the hormones in our body respond by negative feedback. Uh, whenever you see one of this, this is called an axis. This is called an axis. When we go from hypothalamus, anterior pituitary thyroid, that's our axis. 
When you go in this axis, what you see is negative feedback because you don't want levels to just keep increasing and increasing and increasing, right? Good. So uh, hormones are going to be synthesized and released in response to humoral stimuli, neural stimuli, and hormonal stimuli. And so this example here would be, uh, you know, a humoral stimulus of the cold, and the subsequent hormones are released by hormonal stimuli, right? TRH stimulates TSH, TSH stimulates T3 and T4. So what are some of the other humoral stimuli? Well, another example we can look at is our parathyroid glands. The job of parathyroid glands is to synthesize uh, uh, parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone will go on to increase levels of calcium. And so the stimulus for release of parathyroid hormone is low calcium in the blood. Okay, so that's a humoral stimuli. That's a blood stimuli that tells your body to release a certain hormone. That's what we call humoral stimuli. Okay. Neural stimuli involves some sort of nerve fibers. So here we can see that here's our spinal cord. Here's the medulla of the adrenal gland. And we have sympathetic fibers that go from the spinal cord into the medulla of the adrenal gland and cause release of epi- and norepi, okay, epi and norepi. So here we have a neural stimulus that causes a release of a hormone, different from humoral. You can see in humoral, we were looking for certain blood levels of certain uh, electrolytes, or we're looking to respond to the temperatures. Here, we are responding directly to a nerve. Our, a nerve is triggering us to release hormone, okay? And so now we can start talking about the pituitary gland and hypothalamus. Let's start talking about the organs themselves um, because this is really where, the part that can be tricky and um, it's an important concept. So uh, the pituitary gland and hypothalamus are closely related as you can see. This is our uh, hypothalamus. This is our pituitary gland, although I know it looks like something else. This is a pituitary gland, I promise. And what you can see is that these two are very closely related. There's this little stalk in between where you can see uh, for the posterior pituitary, there's some nerves that travel down. In the anterior pituitary, you can see that there's some nerves that, sit, that release something into the blood. That blood goes down into the anterior pituitary. And so these two are very closely related. And so uh, the posterior lobe of the uh, pituitary is actually a downgrowth of hypothalamic neural tissue. So during development, during embryonic development, what happens is a little bit of the hypothalamus grows downwards, grows downwards, 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 as far as it can go. And what that ends up forming is the posterior pituitary. And this makes sense, right? Because you can see that there's nerves here that travel all the way from the hypothalamus and they don't synapse, they don't connect to anything, they basically just completely travel down through the stalk into the posterior pituitary and then release their hormone there. And so it makes sense that the posterior pituitary is a downgrowth of the hypothalamus, okay? And so we have this neural connection. The, the posterior pituitary is important because it releases oxytocin, and antidiuretic hormone. Now, these hormones are released by the posterior pituitary. They're released by the posterior pituitary. However, they are synthesized. They are made in the hypothalamus itself. Okay, and this is going to be different than what we talk about with the anterior pituitary. And so just sort of reviewing this one more time, what you can see is that there's these two nuclei. These nuclei will synthesize the antidiuretic hormone, and the, um, and the oxytocin, okay? It's gonna synthesize in the hypothalamus. However, those two hormones will be released down here in the posterior pituitary. And that's different than what we're gonna talk about in the anterior pituitary, where we have synthesis and release happening in two different places. Okay, great. And so uh, really getting into a lot more detail here, you can see that we have a paraventricular nucleus and the supraoptic nucleus, uh, the, these neurons are going to synthesize that oxytocin or antidiuretic hormone, transport that hormone down the axon, and then release it 
in the posterior pituitary. So you can see here it's being released into the blood supply and it will go and have its downstream effects. Okay, great. So now moving on to the anterior lobe of the hypothalamus or the pituitary, excuse me. So the anterior lobe, instead of being a downgrowth of the hypothalamus, this is an upgrowth. And so uh, embryonically, what happens is we have this little uh, bud of neural tissue that instead of growing down, it actually grows up and it starts to push itself against the hypothalamus. It just pushes, 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 pushes until it gets to these nerve endings, okay? And now these nerve endings can release hormones into the blood supply that will ultimately go down into the anterior pituitary where other hormones are made. And so let's go to the text here. So it originates as an outpocketing of the oral mucosa. We have a few capillary plexuses and uh, portal veins, and it's going to carry releasing and inhibiting hormones to the anterior pituitary. And so let's see what that looks like. So in the hypothalamus, we have synthesis of GHRH, GHIH, TRH, CRH, GNRH, PIH. Just a ton of uh, peptide hormones will be released, uh, synthesized here in the hypothalamus. Those hormones will travel down these nerves and will be released before it gets to the anterior pituitary. Those hormones will then travel down through these veins into the anterior pituitary where they will trigger release of other hormones. So for example, TRH will travel down this nerve, travel down, 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 and in the anterior pituitary, it will bind to a cell and trigger release of TSH. Okay, TRH triggers, triggers TSH. CRH is going to travel down from the hypothalamus and trigger release of ACTH. Okay, GNRH is going to travel down, 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 trigger release of FSH and LH. Okay, and so on and so forth. And so you can see that there's a close connection here, but it's different from the posterior pituitary, where you had hormones synthesized in the hypothalamus. Those same hormones are going to be released by the posterior pituitary. Here, we sort of have a double system. We have hormones being synthesized and then released by the hypothalamus, and then hormones being synthesized and released by the anterior pituitary. Okay, any questions on this so far? So, uh, one thing um, that uh, you know you may see is this evidence of prolactin releasing factor. Uh, this is not a real thing. Uh, so, if you ever see that, just cross it out. It's it's not real. What you do see, however, is that there is presence of dopamine that is related to prolactin, and we're going to talk about how those two are related in a little bit. Okay. Another thing is with antidiuretic hormone, you may also hear it called vasopressin. And I have seen this on questions, um, so keep that in mind. If you ever see vasopressin, this is just the old name for antidiuretic hormone. Okay, great. So let's start talking about all these different hormones. There's so many hormones to talk about, right? They all do something different, um, and uh, you have to memorize what they do. And so uh, it's a pain in the butt, but we will get through it. So let's talk about it. We're going to start off. Uh, with our growth hormone. Uh, these are all going to be proteins. They all work through the GQ receptors. I'm sorry, GS receptors, except for growth hormone, which works through GQ. Okay. Uh, TSH, ACTH, and FSH, LH are all tropic. They regulate secretory action of other endocrine glands. So TSH goes on to increase thyroid hormone. ACTH goes on to increase cortisol. FSH and LH increase levels of estrogen. And so these are all hormones that are going to increase levels of other hormones versus things like your prolactin does not increase levels of any other hormone. Growth hormone uh, doesn't really increase levels of any other hormone, okay? Great. So let's start by talking about our growth hormone. So uh, let's look at our diagram here. So we're gonna start in our anterior pituitary uh, the hypothalamus will secrete growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH. When you see this, when you see GHRH, I want you to think GH is the first two letters, so it must have to do with growth hormone. So the hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone that will go down to the anterior pituitary and cause release of what else? Growth hormone. 
Okay, and so growth hormone is going to have a lot of effects on the body. With a name like growth hormone, you can imagine, they all have to do with growth. And so let's look at some of these effects. So first, let's look at the direct effects. These are going to be metabolic effects. They're anti-insulin. So insulin's job is to decrease blood glucose. Growth hormone's job is going to be to increase it. All right, it's anti-insulin. So let's look at what those effects are. So in fat, it's going to uh, break down fat and release fat into the bloodstream in terms of carbohydrates, increase your blood glucose, and basically anything in insulin does, do the opposite. Okay? So, growth hormone, direct actions, increase fat breakdown, increase blood glucose. Okay? Indirect actions are as important as the direct actions here, and I want you to really focus in on this one hormone, IGF-1. IGF-1 is a hormone they don't talk too much about in medical school, but it's actually pretty important, and it's how growth hormone is going to have a lot of its effects. So IGF-1 is going to have effects on the skeleton to increase skeletal growth, and increase uh, extraskeletally, it's going to increase protein synthesis, cell growth, proliferation. You know, growth hormone is one of those hormones that, uh, you know, people that are doping, trying to get bigger muscles, you know, those bodybuilders, they love growth hormone. Why? It increases your protein synthesis. It breaks down your fat. It just gets you into that, you know, bodybuilding show kind of form, right? And so you often see those people that are bodybuilding training um, using growth hormone for that because of these effects. And so keep that in mind when thinking about the effects there. Okay, so again, just to review, hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone that increases levels of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone has two ways of causing its effects. Directly, the direct effects are to increase fat breakdown and increase blood glucose. The indirect is very important for growth hormone as well. So the indirect is that the growth hormone will go to the liver and increase levels of insulin-like growth factor, or IGF-1. IGF-1 is very important because IGF-1 is going to give the body's ability to grow the skeleton, to uh, synthesize proteins, get bigger muscles, get a taller skeleton. That's all going to be mediated by this IGF-1. Okay, So do not brush this one under the rug with your broomstick like, ah, IGF-1, I don't really need to know that. This is very important. This is how growth hormone is going to have its effects. So please do focus in on this one and um, remember this one. Okay? Great. Any questions on growth hormone? Good. So uh, growth hormone, if levels were too high, say we have some sort of tumor in the pituitary, levels of growth hormone start to get too high, what would your patient look like? Yes, very good. Acromegaly, very good. So the growth of the skull bones, you also see growth of the hand bones, and that is due, of course, to these effects, these indirect effects causing skeletal growth. So if you're to be asked on the USMLE exam, a patient comes in with acromegaly due to um, a, a tumor in the pituitary, and they ask you, what is the direct hormone that's causing the problem? Your answer would be IGF-1. IGF-1 is directly increasing growth of bone. So if they were to ask you that, you would want to say IGF-1. Okay? And typically they won't give you growth hormone as an answer choice as well. That would be a little bit unfair, right? Um, but it would be tricky, right? Um, but in any case, either way, the right answer would be IGF-1 because that is the hormone that's directly doing it, okay? So now sort of the, on the other side of the coin, say you have a patient who um, has too little levels of growth hormone. What would that patient look like? Small growth, right? And so... Um, this is where you look for dwarfism, okay? And um, I don't know if you watch um, soccer or football, but um, you, do you know Leo Messi? So Messi had that problem. He had low levels of growth hormone, actually, when he was growing up. 
However, as he was growing up in uh, Argentina, um, someone noticed his skills and he was able to go to Spain and he got the treatment for low growth hormone. And after getting the treatment, he was able to increase his, his height. And, um, you know, while he's not a really tall person now, at least he's taller than he would have been otherwise. He would have had dwarfism, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, good. Any, any, anything else on this? Leave it alone? Okay, good. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he's, he's really the best in the world, and it's amazing that if he didn't get that hormone treatment, we would never know his name, you know? So, again, stimulates most cells, but really targeting bone and muscle. Uh, encourages use of fat for fuel. Don't forget that part is the, the direct effects, but most uh, effects are going to be mediated by, by GF1. Okay, great. So, um, you already told me all about this. If you have excess in childhood, this leads to gigantism. So, you're looking for a patient who's, you know, seven and a half, eight feet tall. That could be due to too much growth hormone in childhood. However, uh, most of the time when we talk about growth hormones, we're talking about a, a tumor in the pituitary. That is something that happens in adulthood. And once you're already at your adult height, you can't grow anymore. The growth plates are fused. And so there's only a few places in the body that are still able to grow. That includes the skull bone, and that includes some of the bones of the hands and some of the bones of the feet. And so your patient should complain that their hats don't fit, their gloves don't fit, and their shoes don't fit, okay? And so that would be a growth hormone tumor in the pituitary, a pituitary adenoma, okay? Growth hormone deficiency in childhood leads to dwarfism. Uh, growth hormone deficiency in adulthood leads to loss of muscle, loss of bone strength, uh, cognitive affective changes. This is very uncommon. Um, I would say these three are going to be the most important for you. Okay? Great. So moving on to our next axis. This is our next axis. Is our, our thyroid axis. And so here we see our hypothalamus secretes TRH. Anterior pituitary secretes TSH. Thyroid gland releases thyroid hormones, and that will stimulate target cells. Okay, Thyroid hormone is going to have a negative feedback at the anterior pituitary and a negative feedback at the hypothalamus. Okay, And so that is the way that we're able to moderate our levels of thyroid hormones. And so what sorts of effects do thyroid hormones have? Sure. So uh, thyroid hormone, what sort of effects does thyroid hormone have on the body? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Very important point. Thyroid hormone, very important for brain development, especially in utero. Uh, you know, mothers that are thyroid, uh, hypothyroid, their babies end up coming out um, with serious deficiencies. So good. Yes, that's an important one. That's right. Yep. Uh, it has receptors at the bone, giving us proper bone growth. The metabolism as well, um, right? Uh, it speeds up our mitochondria and makes us metabolize things faster. It will increase our heart rate. It will make our bodies feel hotter if we have too much of it. And so really, the thing about thyroid hormones is that they work pretty much every cell of the body, right? You can pick one cell of the body and be like, here's how thyroid hormone will change the effect of this cell. And so thyroid is really going to be spread far and wide. You'll, I'm always being surprised by the things I'm finding out that thyroid does. Okay, And so uh, stimulated by TRH, inhibited by rising blood levels, acts at the pituitary and hypothalamus. So keep this in mind as well. Thyroid does work at the pituitary and the hypothalamus to decrease those levels of TSH and TRH. Okay. So next, our ACTH. ACTH. This one is secreted by a cell called the corticotroph in the anterior pituitary. 
And the job of them are to stimulate the adrenal cortex to release corticosteroids. Okay, and so think about this as cortisol. Okay, so whenever you see this ACTH, I really want you to just remember the C. C for cortisol. The regulation, uh, it's triggered by release of CRH from the hypothalamus. And this release of CRH actually happens in a daily rhythm. And so what you tend to see is that patients have a spike in their cortisol at nighttime, usually around 3, 4 a.m. And this cortisol spike is triggered by CRH, which is being released in a daily or circadian rhythm. Circadian. Circadian, uh, of course, meaning uh, changing from day to night. Okay. Other factors that stress the body, fever, hypoglycemia, any kind of stressor can increase release of CRH. That would increase release of ACTH and increase your release of cortisol. Moving on to the next axis, our gonadotropins are our FSH and LH, and we know these, these are very important for the menstrual cycle. Uh, these are secreted by gonadotrophs in the anterior pituitary, and their release is stimulated by GNRH. Okay? GNRH. Not to be confused with GHRH, right? GHRH is for growth hormone. GNRH is for gonadotropins, okay? So FSH is going to stimulate gamete formation, whether it's an egg or a sperm, depending on the sex of the patient. LH is going to produce more gonadal hormones, so testosterone in men, estrogen in women, okay? So follicle-stimulating hormone, that's what FSH stands for, and luteinizing hormone is what LH stands for. Just always remember, FSH has to do with the egg, whereas LH has to do with the hormones. Okay. Great. Not really seen before puberty. And regulation, again, triggered by GNRH during and after puberty and suppressed by gonadal hormones. So if you have high levels of testosterone, that will cause levels of GNRH to fall, of FSH to fall, of LH to fall. Okay? And so remember that that axis that we drew for the thyroid hormones, this axis is working in the same way. Where? The ultimate product, the estrogen or the testosterone, will go back and inhibit release of FSH and LH and inhibit release of GNRH at the hypothalamus. Okay? Great. Uh, prolactin. Prolactin is a very special case. The prolactin is a hormone they love love, love to ask about, okay? And I'm about to tell you why. So prolactin is secreted by lactotrophs in the anterior pituitary. It stimulates milk production uh, slowly and in the long term, as well as, as increase of growth in some of the breast tissue. Now, regulation of release of prolactin. This is the reason that they love to ask about it. Prolactin will always be released 24-7, 365, unless dopamine is present. Dopamine inhibits prolactin. Dopamine stops prolactin from being released. Okay? So if you ever take away dopamine, prolactin levels will increase. Okay? So this is very important. And the reason is because if we look at where the dopamine is coming from, here's our hypothalamus. Here is our anterior pituitary, okay? And so prolactin is being released here, right? Prolactin is being released from the anterior pituitary. We have dopamine coming from the hypothalamus, coming down the stalk and inhibiting the anterior pituitary from making prolactin. That's happening all the time. Dopamine is just coming in, coming in, coming in, and stopping prolactin from being released. During, um, you know... Uh, pregnancy, dopamine levels are going to fall. If dopamine levels fall, prolactin levels will increase. And that's what we want, right? During pregnancy and after pregnancy, we want to have nice, good uh, amount of milk production. And so, um, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, dopamine levels fall, prolactin levels rise. Uh, however, after a long period of time, eventually, you know, when the baby stops nursing, uh, 
um, the prolactin levels will fall again because dopamine levels increase. Okay, and so these two have an antagonistic relationship with each other. So what are some of the things that increase prolactin release? Suckling stimulates prolactin release and promotes continued milk production. So that that um, that nervous stimulus, that sensation of suckling at the breast is going to drop levels of dopamine. Dropping levels of dopamine means increasing levels of prolactin. Okay? And so, last thing that I would like to mention here before we move on is uh, actually a question that I have for you. Okay? And this is a question that I often see in, um, in different um, question banks. Okay? So, say you have um, a patient who gets into a very bad car accident, not wearing their seatbelt, they hit their head on the steering wheel, not good. And so you give your patient an MRI, and what you see is that the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary is broken. There's no connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. What will happen to levels of prolactin? Will they increase or decrease or stay the same? They will increase, good, because we've lost that inhibitory dopamine from crossing over. Natalia, I guarantee you some kind of question like that is going to be on your step one, okay? You, you got to know this dopamine inhibiting prolactin, and it really seems like you do, okay? I'm very happy. Last thing, last, last thing I want to say about prolactin before we move on, and I'm going to repeat this again when we talk about our pathology, is that when your patient has a tumor in the anterior pituitary, a pituitary adenoma, 99% of the time, it's going to be a prolactinoma. Okay? So tumors of the pituitary, they could be an ACTH tumor, a growth hormone tumor, a um, FSH tumor, an LH tumor, a prolactin tumor. 99% of the time, it's going to be prolactin. Not all of those other five that I mentioned. Okay? And so we can kind of group everything beautifully together here and look at all of the axes together. This is a um, image where I'd really like you to be able to sort of put a box on top of one of these areas, cross everything out and be able to fill it in. Okay, so for ACTH, what stimulates release of ACTH? What stimulates release of TSH? What stimulates release of LH and FSH? So on and so forth. And be able to do that on your own. When you can do that, you're going to be in a really strong place for endocrine section. I know you said this is not your strongest section, and so um, spend some time with this and really be comfortable with it, okay? Okay. All right, any questions? I mean, this is all the stuff that we've just discussed. Um, any questions on this? You sure? Okay, good. Okay, so... Uh, talking about um, the pituitary adenomas, I told you the most common type is a uh, prolactin adenoma, a prolactin secreting adenoma. So what do we do for these patients? We actually will go through the nose, through the ethmoid bone, and shave away that tumor. And so you can see uh, it's kind of shown here. Here's our sphenoid bone. We go through this bone and just shave off whatever tumor tissue is there in order to um, stop this patient from having their symptoms. Okay? Good. Okay, and just sort of showing here is how the curette goes through the sphenoid sinus and uh, will end up taking out this pituitary tumor. Okay? And so, you know, this is important because uh, this, this, the name of this surgery is transsphenoidal resection of pituitary mass. You may see that as an answer choice as uh, what should we do next with this patient? Um, and uh, this is one of the treatment strategies for patients with pituitary tumors. Okay. Great. So our posterior pituitary now, again, we talked about how are the neurons here. They synthesize the hormone and carry that hormone into the posterior pituitary to release it there. The um, hormones we're talking about are antidiuretic hormone, oxytocin, and both of these are going to be using G sub Q receptors. 
right? So ADH will go on to the kidneys. When they get there, at the kidneys, they're going to bind a G sub Q receptor. Oxytocin is going to go on to the uh, uterus during childbirth and bind to those uterine cells and trigger G sub Q. Oxytocin is important for childbirth, causing contractions, and, um, and so that's sort of why it's, uh, what it's important for there. So again, uterine contractions during childbirth. There's also some, uh, it also triggers milk ejection during, during, uh, for women producing milk. And so keep in mind, this is different from what prolactin is doing. Prolactin causes um, milk production. Oxytocin causes milk ejection. Okay, and so you need both parts, right? You can't, if, if you know, this baby's sucking and you're having this milk ejection, but there's nothing there, that's not very helpful, right? And then if you're having this milk production, but there's no baby sucking and no ejection, that's not helpful either. And so you need both parts. Uh, so suckling is going to stimulate oxytocin release. And this is going to be an example of a positive feedback loop, right? Normally, we have a negative feedback loop where we have a stimulus, the hormone responds, and then the levels of the hormone drop. Instead, the baby is going to be the stimulus. The baby is going to be sucking, increasing levels of oxytocin. As the milk comes out, the baby continues sucking. That increases oxytocin, right? So we have a positive feedback loop here, okay? Great. And it's also been said that this is the love hormone. If you have a sudden increase in the oxytocin in your blood, that is said to um, give you feelings of passion and love when you have that release of oxytocin, okay? Great. Antidiuretic hormone is a lot less exciting than oxytocin. <laughs> so antidiuretic hormone, all it does is enhance water retention. Okay, It's released whenever our plasma osmolality is high or, or whenever our blood pressure is low. So osmolality is high. We have a very concentrated salty blood that increases release of antidiuretic hormone. That antidiuretic hormone will go to the kidneys. We will have those aquaporins placed into the collecting ducts. The aquaporins will suck the water out of the filtrate that is going down to become urine. And we're going to have more concentrated urine, but a more dilute blood. Okay. And so antidiuretic hormone, very important hormone. We're going to talk about when levels are too high. When levels are too high, that's something called SIADH. And we're going to talk about when levels are too low. That's something called diabetes insipidus. Okay. And uh, I know this is an area that you have a lot of questions about, SIADH versus diabetes insipidus. I know because I used to always get them confused. And so we're going to talk about what they are and um, make sure you never get confused on those again. Okay. So antidiuretic hormone deficiency is diabetes insipidus. Here, remember, this is an anti diuretic hormone, anti-diuresis, okay? If we lack an anti-diuresis hormone, that's going to be pro-diuresis. And so when we don't have anti-diuretic hormone, that means we're going to have more urine, huge output of urine and intense thirst. That's what we call diabetes insipidus, okay? And that's our anti-diuretic hormone deficiency. If you don't have the hormone that prevents you from peeing, you're going to pee, right? And that, that makes sense. And so, antidiuretic hormone deficiency, we look for lots of urine, intense thirst. If we look at the blood, we're gonna see very, very uh, salty blood. We're not able to retain any of our water, so blood gets salty. Now, let's flip that coin. Antidiuretic hormone hypersecretion. We call this syndrome of antidiuretic hormone release. And uh, this can be seen after neurosurgery, trauma, and what happens here is that we retain too much water. We retain too much water. And so, my question for you, if we're retaining too much water, are we going to have a concentrated urine or a very dilute urine? Very good. We have too much antidiuretic hormone, 
it's really concentrating the urine hard, and so that's what we look for. Okay? Good. And we'll go over this again when we do pathology um, to really hammer it home. Okay? <laughs> so, if you could please read through this, Natalia, and um, uh, let me know what, which, when you finish, and we'll talk about what you think could be going on. Okay. So, what do you think of Miss Luisa? Lucia? Good, good. And so, we can sort of look at her uh, blood levels here. Um, one of the things to notice is with our diabetes insipidus, we see a uh, orthostatic hypotension, meaning when our patient goes from supine to standing, their blood pressure drops. And this is because everything they drink, they're peeing it out, so their blood pressure is dropping. And they may look dehydrated, and then we can see this very low specific gravity of the urine, meaning the urine is very dilute. If you see specific gravity that's around the, the number one, think about dilute urine. Okay, great. So, uh, Luisa is hospitalized, underwent a dehydration test. Okay, uh, she was denied any fluid intake. Doctors carefully analyzed her vital signs and urine output during this process. Because she had been advised to drink a lot of water because before coming to the hospital, her initial supine upright blood pressure were normal. Analysis showed that Lucia was urinating at a rate of 500 cc's per hour. The specific gravity remained at 1.001, even though she became dehydrated to the point where she became orthostatic. And so what this means is that uh, even though she's becoming more dehydrated, her blood is becoming more concentrated, her urine is staying dilute. And that really fits with that diabetes insipidus picture. That's how we test for diabetes insipidus. And so now that we know it's diabetes insipidus for sure, even though you knew it before, Natalia, I wanted to have some testing. So we did the testing. And we said it's diabetes insipidus. Now, there's two ways to get diabetes insipidus. Either we can have low levels of antidiuretic hormone. So say we, uh, you know, this is a patient who had some sort of brain trauma that damaged the uh, pituitary, the posterior pituitary or the hypothalamus, and now antidiuretic hormone levels are low in the blood. Okay, so that would be a primary diabetes insipidus. However, the levels of antidiuretic hormone can be normal in the blood, but if we have a problem with the antidiuretic hormone receptor, then antidiuretic hormone won't be able to bind. And so, this would be a secondary diabetes insipidus or a peripheral diabetes insipidus. A central diabetes insipidus, not enough hormone. Peripheral diabetes insipidus, the cells of the kidney are not responding to antidiuretic hormone, okay? And so we know our patient has diabetes insipidus and now we wanna know whether it's because she doesn't have the hormone or because she has some sort of kidney problem. And so what do we do? How do we figure out which one it is? Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, you're right. So, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, so what I was going to say was that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so, uh, we are suspecting diabetes insipidus. We don't know what kind. So, if it's due to lack of antidiuretic hormone, what we could do is just give her some antidiuretic hormone. If we give her the antidiuretic hormone, and then her, uh, she stops peeing and her blood pressure goes back to normal, 
then we know that that was the problem. She doesn't have enough. However, if we give her antidiuretic hormone and nothing changes, then we know that she has normal levels of antidiuretic hormone in the blood and the problem is in the receptors in the kidney. Okay, that's a peripheral. All right, so the uh, type of antidiuretic hormone that we give is something called DDAVP. DDAVP. You may, you may also hear it called desmopressin. Desmopressin. That is the exogenous, synthesized in a laboratory antidiuretic hormone that we can give to these patients. Okay, so let's read what the slide says. Uh, so Lucia was given antidiuretic hormone, which resulted in a marked decline of her urine output from 500 to 70. Nurses collected, administered IV fluids. She discharged with, oh, here we go, desmopressin. Okay. And so it returns her levels of ADH to normal, helps her kidneys retain water. And she will need to take that for the rest of her life pretty much. And that's fine. There's not too many side effects from it. You want to make sure she's not taking too much. If she takes too much, that's going to give her SIADH, and we don't want that either. So make sure it's titrated to the right level, and she should be good to go. Okay, any questions on this? Good question. Yeah, good question. And so uh, typically, um, this test that we've just described is called the water deprivation test. That includes giving the antidiuretic hormone is part of the water deprivation test. And so what I want you to look for uh, in these questions is they're gonna typically give you two charts like this, okay? One of them is going to be your plasma, plasma osmolarity. The other one is gonna be urine osmolarity, okay? And uh, on the bottom, they're going to have time. And so typically, the time that you wait is about 12 hours, and then it'll go through 14, it'll go to 16, it'll go to 18, it'll go to 20, okay? And so what you look for is your plasma osmolarity should be slowly increasing, and then right around 16 hours, you're going to give your desmopressin, I'm writing des for desmopressin, and then your plasma osmolarity will start to drop back down to normal, okay? And so next to that, they'll have the urine osmolarity, which will be very, very low. And then right at 16 hours, you'll give the desmopressin. Okay, give the desmopressin and then urine will go back up like this, okay? So urine will become more concentrated, plasma becomes less concentrated, okay? And so if we were to contrast this with a normal patient, uh, let's see if I can change colors here to blue. So for a normal patient, what you would see is plasma osmolarity might increase a little bit over this time period, but not that much because we have antidiuretic hormone. And so for their urine osmolarity, uh, instead there you would just see a slow increase until it kind of maxes out. Okay, So that would be for a normal patient. All right, And so we talked about normal, we talked about central diabetes insipidus. The last one that we could draw on here would be our peripheral diabetes insipidus. And so peripheral diabetes insipidus, we would see a slow increase of our plasma osmolarity, just like in central. However, after we give desmopressin, the osmolarity would continue to just be high. For the urine osmolarity, again, urine osmolarity would be very, very low, copious amounts of urine. And even after giving desmopressin at this point, urine osmolarity would stay low. Okay. All right, great. Very good question. So to answer you in the longest way possible, <laughs> the answer is about 16 hours. You'll see 14, 16, 18, somewhere in there, long enough for them to become essentially dehydrated. You want to get them dehydrated because you know if they're dehydrated, antidiuretic hormone should be released, and so you can do your test. All right. Great. And so just another uh, sort of chart uh, showing an overview of all the hormones and how they work. Okay, great. So uh, moving on to our thyroid gland, uh, you can see here is a diagram showing where the thyroid is in relation to the aorta, all the branches there. You can see that it gets a lot of really good blood supply. 
Lots of branches of the uh, carotids will go here to the thyroid to give it really nice blood supply. Uh, and that's important because it's always synthesizing this hormone that really just kind of goes everywhere. Uh, and so microscopically, and this is an important um, this is an important picture to be comfortable with. Uh, what I'd like you to see is that we have these things called follicles, and follicles is where we have all of the stored thyroid hormone. So this big pink space is all full of T3 and T4. T3 and T4 are all living in here. Uh, and then next to the th to the follicle, we have all of the thyroid cells. These are the cells that will be responding to TSH. When TSH binds to this cell, this cell will take up a little bit of the colloid. It will process it and then release it into the bloodstream as T3 or T4. Okay? So we have our fo follicular cell. Follicular cells respond to TSH. And when TSH bind to them, they take up a little bit of that thyroid hormone and then release it into the blood supply. So thyroid hormone is actually two different compounds. So we have our T4 and our T3, like we talked about before. The only difference is the number of iodine atoms that are bound to it. So T4 has four iodine, T3 has three iodine. Um, otherwise, they're, they're pretty similar. T3 is the active form. T4 is just the form that it travels through the blood in the T4 form, but you need that T3 form to manifest any sort of um, any sort of change in the cell. To, to whatever you're trying to change, you need that T3. So again, it's a major metabolic hormone, increases your metabolic rate, heat production, uh, tissue growth, skeletal and nervous systems, reproductive capabilities. I didn't put it on here, but I think it's very important what you mentioned earlier, Natalia. Nervous system development and our em embryonic development it d is dependent on thyroid hormone. And so that's a really good point there too. And so uh, this is sort of zoomed in what I was describing for you before. Here's our colloid. Here is our parafollicular cell, our thyroid cell. Here's our bloodstream. And so what we can see is that these cells will take up a little bit of iodine. Iodine will go into the colloid. Once it's inside the colloid, it's going to bind onto some thyroglobulin, okay? And that forms the DIT and MIT. Uh, eventually, that will be converted into T3 and T4. That T3 and T4 will be uh, entered into a vesicle, and that vesicle will release it into the blood supply. Okay, and just so so that's sort of how this whole process works. And again, TSH is the hormone that's triggering all of this to happen. While in the blood, T3 and T4 are bound by uh, proteins, like we mentioned before. Uh, most of these steroid-like hormones are going to be bound to proteins. Uh, both bind to target receptors, but again, T3 is your active form. Uh, it's 10 times more active than T4, so we don't really even consider T4 as the active form. We consider T3 as the active form. And so those peripheral tissues will be able to convert T4 to T3 so we can uh, have the effect that we're looking for. Uh, regulation, and you know, I think this is probably the fifth time I've shown you this chart, but just keeping in mind that the hypothalamus is in charge of this whole thing, uh, ultimately uh, causing release of thyroid to have its effect on target cells. So having uh, too much thyroid hormone, what can happen? So if you don't have enough, uh, if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, you can end up in uh, mixed edema, which can result in a coma. You can also end up with a bunch of edema in front of your tibia in the leg. And so seeing some uh, edema there is due to low thyroid levels. If your low thyroid is due to lack of iodine, uh, you may see an endemic goiter. As you can see, this little boy has a growth in his neck representing a goiter. The thyroid cells of the thyroid are really growing and becoming hyperplastic in response to that low iodine level. They're trying their best to create thyroid hormone, but they can't. There's no iodine. Seeing low levels of thyroid hormone in infants gives you cretinism. Uh, and so other side of the coin, you can have Graves disease, uh, which is a hypersecretion. Uh, Graves disease is an autoimmune disease where we see antibodies 
that bind to TSH receptors. Antibodies that bind to TSH receptors. Uh, and so some of the things we can see there, obviously hyperthyroidism, everything that goes with that, your heat intolerance, rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, um, you know, uh, tremors, thin hair, thin skin, all of those things that go with hyperthyroidism, plus these bulging eyes. These bulging eyes are typical in Graves' disease, where you have an antibody that binds to TSH receptors. Okay? Are you pretty comfortable with Graves' disease? Yeah, you know this one? Okay. Good. Great. So, uh, parathyroid glands, four glands. I don't know why I put to eight. Uh, four glands embedded in the posterior aspect of the thyroid. Uh, they contain oxyphil cells and the cells that actually do a job, which are the chief cells, uh, and these secrete parathyroid hormone. Uh, parathyroid hormone is the most important hormone in calcium home homeostasis. So we can see... Here are our parathyroid glands next to our thyroid, um, and they are going to be responding to low calcium levels by releasing uh, parathyroid hormone. So what does parathyroid hormone even do? How does it have its effect? So hypocalcemia, low blood calcium, is going to be detected by the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid gland increases levels of parathyroid hormone. Go figure. So what does parathyroid hormone do? So number one, it's going to break down bone. Increases osteoclast activity, causes release of calcium and phosphate into the blood. Okay, so number one, it's going to break down bone, release any calcium and phosphate in the bone into the bloodstream. Number two, it's going to cause resorption of calcium in the kidneys. Okay, and not only does it cause uh, reabsorption of calcium, it causes a decrease in your phosphate. Okay. And so all that phosphate that was released from bone is going to be leaving the body through the kidneys. Uh, parathyroid hormone is a phosphate-wasting hormone. It lowers the level of phosphate. Okay. And last, it works by increasing activation of vitamin D. And so in the kidney, we have this 1-alpha-hydroxylase. Uh, we've mentioned this before, right, when we talked about uh, sarcoidosis and non-caseating granulomas and macrophages, how they have 1-alpha-hydroxylase. And I told you 1-alpha-hydroxylase is that enzyme that causes 25 vitamin D to be converted to its active form, which is 1-25 vitamin D. 1-25 vitamin D is going to go to the small intestine. It's going to increase calcium absorption and it's going to increase phosphate absorption. Okay, so we had to do a little editing on this slide because it doesn't really talk about phosphate too much. And so overall, uh, what are the effects going to be? So high phosphate causes increased calcium and overall a decrease in your phosphate, okay, because of those effects at the kidneys. Questions on this? Do you want me to go over it again? Yes, great. I'm actually going to erase everything. Do it one more time. So the parathyroid glands located in the back of the thyroid, they release parathyroid hormone whenever they detect a low blood calcium. How do they even do that? How do cells know when calcium is low? So parathyroid cells have a certain receptor called the CASR. And I'm sure you can guess what that stands for, right? Calcium sensing receptor. Oh my God, what a creative name, right? So these parathyroid cells have a calcium sensing receptor. When calcium gets low, they are going to respond by increasing parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone goes to the bone. It causes breakdown of bone, breakdown of bone. When you break down bone, that's going to increase your calcium level in the blood and increase your phosphate level in the blood. Okay, so both of those are going to increase. Parathyroid hormone is going to go to the kidneys. In the kidneys, it's going to cause increased resorption of calcium. It's also going to cause a drop in phosphate. Okay, and so we said before, all of the phosphate that we had released from bone is all going to be leaving the body. 
because parathyroid hormone has this dual effect. It breaks down bone to release those two parts into the blood, and when that blood gets to the kidney, it's going to cause calcium to stay and phosphate to go. Okay. It also increases the activity of 1-alpha hydroxylase. 1-alpha hydroxylase is going to convert our 25 vitamin D to 1-25 vitamin D. 25 vitamin D. Great. 125 vitamin D is going to go to the small intestine. It's going to resorb all the calcium in the food that we're eating, and it's going to absorb all of the phosphate in the food that we're eating. Okay. Overall, the effect of all of these things is to increase the calcium in the blood and decrease the phosphate in the blood. Okay. And so, one of the thoughts that you may have at this point is, well, I see that we have two things that are increasing the phosphate and one thing that's decreasing the phosphate. So how is the overall effect decreasing phosphate, right? If you have two positives and one negative, that doesn't equal negative one, that should equal one. So what is going on here? And so what we see here is actually anything that goes in your blood has to go to the kidney right? Yes, we're getting more from the bone. Yes, we're getting more from the intestine. But where's it going? It's going in the blood. Where does that blood go? It goes to the kidney. You cannot skip this step, right? Uh, the kidney is going to get that blood. When that blood gets to the kidney, parathyroid hormone is going to be the boss here and say, nope, listen, vitamin D, I know you're over there increasing my phosphate, but you know, I really don't want phosphate in the blood right now. And so what we see is that parathyroid hormone rules Parathyroid hormone is the one in charge, and they are saying lower, lower the phosphate, increase the calcium. Okay, and so why is this important? Why do we care? Well, if we see uh, the same reason that uh, we care about anything else because things can go wrong. And so if we have an excess of parathyroid hormone, you know, and you see these questions all the time, typically they involve arrows, right? And then you'll have your calcium, you'll have phosphate, and then you'll have an up arrow, you'll have a down arrow, you'll have a down arrow, you'll have an up arrow, you'll have a line, you'll have an up arrow. You're not, you know, you're going to have a question like this. And they're going to say, okay, so say you have a tumor, one of these little parathyroid glands turns into an adenoma and starts secreting PTH. Which of these options are you going to see? A, B, C, or D, which is an increase of both. A, excellent. Parathyroid hormone, it loves increasing the calcium, it loves decreasing the phosphate, okay? And so high calcium means we're gonna have uh, bone pain because we're breaking down a lot of bones. We're gonna have kidney stones because we have all this calcium that's going to the kidneys. We're gonna have some other um, effects that we'll talk about uh, when we get into pathology, but um, those are some of the things we see, okay? Great, and so, so that's for high parathyroid hormone. Now. What happens if you have a patient, we talked about sarcoidosis, can increase your levels of vitamin D. Say your patient has too much vitamin D in their blood supply. Which of these options would you pick? What is going to happen to the level of calcium and phosphate in the blood? Mm-hmm, good. So we'll take out... So vitamin D is going to increase the phosphate. You're 100% right. But it's also increasing the calcium. Okay. And so when you have too much vitamin D, you're looking for an increase in everything. Okay. And so that's what you are looking for there. Um, and again, this is a topic that gets asked about a lot. You got to be able to tell the difference between high parathyroid hormone and high vitamin D. Okay. Very good, very good. So again, hyperparathyroidism due to a tumor. Typically, you know, one of those parathyroid glands develops a little adenoma on it. Uh, bones soften and deform. Elevated calcium depresses the nervous system. 
leads to kidney stones and um, and so you know we see a lot of you know symptoms there hypothyroidism typically following some sort of trauma or say we try and take out the thyroid there's some sort of cancer in the thyroid and we accidentally take out a parathyroid gland with it oh no what happens so we look for tetany respiratory paralysis and death if it's untreated Okay. Oh, that's okay. Any questions? Okay. Great. So moving on to our adrenal glands. Uh, of course, we have two of them, one on top of each kidney. And so really, we talk about the adrenal glands like the one gland, but really they function as two different glands. So you have the adrenal medulla. That is the middle part of the adrenal gland. And this is the part that has nerves coming from our spinal cord and synapsing here. And synapsing there causes release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, okay? And so from the medulla, we get our epi and our norepi, okay? And so that's the medulla. The adrenal cortex are three layers of granular tissue that synthesize and release corticosteroids. So our cortisol, our aldosterone, our androgens, are all released by the adrenal cortex. Those are all steroid hormones. So again, this is really two glands in one. You have one that's releasing a bunch of steroid hormones and responds to ACTH or responds to angiotensin II in the case of aldosterone or um, androgens uh, sort of respond to, you know, sort of other things as well. So you have that going on in the cortex. In the medulla, you have responding to a direct nervous stimulation. You have an actual nerve that synapses there in the medulla and causes increase in the hormone, okay? Great. So let's look at the levels here. So we have our glomerulosa, our fasciculata, our reticularis. How do we remember which is which? We remember that we're talking about something near the kidney here. Kidney makes us think of GFR. And so GFR, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, okay? So G, F, R are the layers of the adrenal gland, okay? Great. Now, the glomerulosa uh, secretes mineral corticoids, a.k.a. aldosterone. Fasciculata, glucocorticoids, a.k.a. cortisol. And our sex hormones are, are not glucocorticoids. Our sex hormones are released by the reticularis. Now, how do you remember which is which? So we know it goes GFR. The next thing you need to remember is salt, sugar, sex. So salt from the glomerulosa, sugar from the fasciculata, sugar meaning glucocorticoids, right? Glucocorticoids, salt, sugar, and sex hormones from the reticularis. Okay, so GFR, salt, sugar, sex, and that really is going to help you so much on these questions, remembering which layer is which. Um, and the last thing I want to mention before we move forward, this image here, um, it's in your slides, you know, as you're going through the PDF, remember this image. That's all I can say. For your step one, remember this image. I had a question on my step one that uh, gave me this slide showing me the layers of the adrenal gland. And it said, and there was an A here, a B here, a C here, and a D. And it said, uh, oh, okay, yeah, so where does cortisol come from? And I'm looking at this, like, bunch of lines and dots, and I have no idea what I'm looking at, right? And so I just took a deep breath. I remembered what the adrenal gland architecture is. I should see a layer for salt. I should see a layer for sugar. I should see a layer for sex. And I should see a layer that produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so organizing it in that way, I said, okay, you're asking about cortisol. That's from the second layer. That's sugar. That would be B. Okay. Questions on this? No? Okay, great. So starting from that first layer, from our glomerulosa, uh, the job here is done by aldosterone, and its job is to regulate electrolytes, primarily sodium, potassium. And so, <coughs> excuse me. Wow. 
So sodium, very important because it affects the ECF volume. We said before that water follows salt. Anything in your body that increases the amount of salt is going to increase the amount of water. Right? Think about your patients with hypertension. What do you tell them to stop eating? Salty foods, right? The more salt they eat, the more water is going to be in their blood. The more water is in their blood, the higher their blood pressure. Water follows salt. So that's why sodium is so important because it affects that ECF volume. The blood volume, blood pressure, and the levels of other ions. And potassium is very important because it's all about that resting membrane potential. Think about the heart. Uh, you want the heart to beat in a nice smooth way. If you change the amount of potassium that's around, you may risk arrhythmias and uh, cardiac failure. So potassium, very important as well. Aldosterone, the most potent mineral corticoid. What does it do? Stimulates sodium reabsorption. Increases levels of sodium. Decreases levels of potassium. Increases levels of sodium. Decreases levels of potassium. So we look for salt, uh, sodium reabsorption, and potassium wasting. Okay? This element is so important that high potassium levels actually stimulate release of aldosterone. Potassium itself stimulates release of aldosterone. Okay? The other thing that stimulates release of aldosterone is going to be angiotensin 2, part of our RAS system, our renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Uh, angiotensin 2 will stimulate release of aldosterone. Potassium, high levels of potassium, will stimulate release of aldosterone. Okay? So, again, uh, sort of going over again what I just sort of told you, uh, renin-angiotensin mechanism, so decreased blood pressure causes increase in renin. Renin causes formation of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 causes aldosterone release. Okay? So, again, just following that whole mechanism, starting from the kidneys. Kidneys detect a low blood pressure. Whenever the kidneys feel like the blood pressure is getting low, they respond by releasing renin. Renin, through a different mechanism, is going to cause a formation of angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is going to cause release of aldosterone. Aldosterone goes on to increase sodium levels. Increase sodium. And do what to potassium? Decrease potassium. Excellent. Plasma concentration of potassium. So, increased potassium directly influences glomerulosa cells to release aldosterone. This one's important and does get asked about sometimes. Last, ACTH will cause a small increase of aldosterone, mostly during stress, ACTH levels being very, very high. The way ACTH works is, yes, we have these three layers of the adrenal gland, right? We have our salt, we have our sugar, we have our sex. Uh... Instead of being such fine categories, ACTH will really go everywhere and tell it to start working. And so high levels of ACTH will give you, yes, it's going to increase your level of cortisol. That's going to be the major thing. But you'll also see small increases in aldosterone. I'm drawing it, trying to write it small. And small increases in your androgens or sex hormones. Okay. So the primary thing is cortisol, but because ACTH is just so promiscuous, uh, it will increase levels of the other um, um, adrenal hormones as well. Last, ANP is going to inhibit renin production, inhibit aldosterone secretion to decrease the blood pressure. Do you happen to remember where atrial natriuretic peptide comes from? ANP and BNP? Where do these come from? What 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 were you thinking? Okay. No, that's okay. So A and P and B and P are released by the heart. Whoa, the heart has endocrine function. Yes, it does, believe it or not. 
And so whenever the atria starts to get stretched, the atrial cells getting stretched, they take that to mean that blood pressure is too high. And so if the atrial cells feel like they're getting stretched out, they release ANP. ANP will inhibit renin and inhibit aldosterone. And in doing so, that's going to inhibit, that's going to decrease the amount of sodium that we're retaining. Again, water follows salt. If we're peeing out all of our sodium, we are going to be reducing our blood pressure because we pee out the water too. So that's our ANP. BNP is the same thing, but for the ventricles. Okay, so when the ventricles get stretched, they don't like it. They think it means high blood pressure, so they act to decrease the blood pressure. Okay, so this is a pretty high yield slide. A lot of information on here, um, so definitely review it again uh, when you have some time. Okay, great. So uh, again, sort of talking about all of the effects of aldosterone and uh, where um, angiotensin II plays a role, potassium, everything else. Okay. So moving right along here, cortisol, we talked about salt, here's sugar. Cortisol keeps blood sugar levels constant, maintains the blood pressure. I cannot emphasize this one enough. I cannot emphasize this one enough. Cortisol increases your blood pressure. If you have a patient that loses all of their cortisol, that patient's going to die. Their blood pressure is gonna go to zero over zero, okay? Cortisol is very, very important for blood pressure, okay? I cannot emphasize that enough. So cortisol is re released in response to ACTH. Uh, it has that, um, that pattern that is circadian we talked about before. It increases overnight. Uh, metabolically, it increases the amount of glucose that's in our bloodstream. Uh, fatty acids, amino acids, saving the glucose for the brain, that's, that's, that's the goal here. And so if you have too much cortisol, you have something called Cushing's syndrome. Cushing syndrome, you know all about Cushing syndrome, Natalia. I know I don't have to tell you, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, just for the fun of it. So uh, Cushing syndrome, what, what happens when you have too much cortisol? Depresses the cartilage and bone formation. We're talking, talking about weak bones. Inhibits inflammation. Your patient's going to have, um, going to have some uh, infections, depressing the immune system. Promotes changes in cardiovascular, neuro, gastrointestinal function. We end up having fat deposition around the abdomen, our buffalo hump, our moon faces, our um, striae on the abdomen, purple lines like this on the abdomen called striae we see in Cushing syndrome, right? Did I forget anything? No? <laughs> I think you're being nice. Hyposecretion, this is our Addison's disease. So in Addison's disease, what happens, Addison is an autoimmune disease where the T cells go into the adrenal glands and start attacking all of our uh, cortisol secreting cells. We lose all of our cortisol, we lose all of our aldosterone. So what happens? Decrease in your glucose level, decrease in your sodium level, you end up with weight loss, dehydration, and hypotension. Again, Losing cortisol means you're going to have a big drop in your blood pressure. So keep that in mind um, for your Addison's disease patients. All right, so patient before onset, and here you can see Cushing syndrome. Oh my goodness, what is this? That is a buffalo hump. Very good. And so I don't know how they got this woman to agree to do this, but um, it is a very nice example of what you can see. And you can also see even just the shape of her face. You can see that there's a little bit more fat uh, deposition. I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but you, I mean, just objectively, you can see that there's a little bit more fat deposition around the face than originally, um, originally here. Okay. Great. Uh, so the last level are gonadocorticoids or our sex hormones. Most of them are going to be androgens, which are our male sex hormones, which will ultimately be converted to testosterone or estrogen. So these contribute to the onset of puberty, especially the appearance of secondary sex characteristics. What this means is, if you have high levels of gonadocorticoids, expect to see secondary sex characteristics early. Expect to see them early. I'm talking about 
uh, having, you know, um, hair growth in a patient who's seven or eight years old. Okay, things like that are what you see early. Uh, sex drive, high levels of gonadocorticoids give you a high sex drive, uh, active sex drive. Uh, estrogens and postmenopausal women are all coming from the uh, um, adrenal glands. Okay. Great. And so now moving into the very um, inner part, the juicy center of the adrenal gland, the adrenal medulla. These cells secrete epinephrine primarily as well as norepinephrine. And as you know, epinephrine causes constriction of blood vessels, increased heart rate, increases your blood glucose to rise, and causes blood to go to the brain, heart, and skeletal muscle. Epinephrine is going to stimulate metabolic activities, bronchial dilation, blood flow to skeletal muscles. This is our fight or flight hormone. This is really stimulating you to uh, be ready to run away from that bear. Okay. And so we have a question here. A 45-year-old man is diagnosed with primary hypoaldosteronism. Which of the following laboratory results is most consistent with its diagnosis? And we have a bunch of arrows. You serum sodium, serum potassium, serum bicarbonate, urine sodium, urine potassium. Okay. So have a look at this and let me know what you think, what your thought process is. Good. Good. Wait, uh, hypo, hypo aldosteronism. Hypo, yep. That seems important. Decrease, good, yes. So we'll take out these. Good, very good. So we'll take this one out as well. Yes. Nice. Very good. Bicarbonate is going to be low. Um, and that is really going to be your way of figuring out this answer. I thought that this was a very hard question. So I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised you're able to figure it out that quickly. Um, so again, hypoaldosteronism, make sure you're really reading the question carefully. I know I said it, I might not have said it very clearly. Um, so, but make sure you're reading the question clearly next time. And you see that hypoaldosterone, you know what aldosterone does. And so you just sort of have to go and look for the opposite. Okay. And good. And knowing that bicarbonate is going to be low. And so, uh, you know, one of the reasons there, aldosterone is going to increase bicarbonate, uh, in the serum directly number one. And number two, I want you to keep something in mind that we mentioned briefly before, and that's that every cell in the body has a certain exchanger, okay? And that exchanger exchanges potassium for hydrogen, okay? And so, here's the inside of our cell, here's the outside, and so, when potassium starts to get high, this exchanger is going to start working overtime. It's going to be taking up potassium because we don't want a lot of potassium in our bloodstream. That can cause us to have arrhythmias in the heart. And so our cells are going to respond. They, say, they see potassium is high and they say, whoa, 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 I want to get potassium down. Let me exchange it for any hydrogen inside of me. And so it starts pumping the hydrogen into the blood and taking potassium out pumping out hydrogen, taking in potassium, pumping out hydrogen, taking in potassium. And so what ends up happening is hydrogen gets very high in the bloodstream. So our bloodstream is getting more acidic. When you have acidic blood, you're going to see a low bicarbonate. And so that, that is the second way that causes low bicarbonate. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, great. So let's uh, keep it moving here. Uh, so 
In, of the adrenal medulla, we can talk about uh, when there's too much secretion of those epinephrine and norepinephrine. So hypoglycemia, increased metabolic rate, rapid heartbeat, palpitations, hypertension, increased nervousness, sweating. This can be due to a tumor, right? So what do we call a tumor of the adrenal medulla that causes all of these things? Starts with a P. Yes, very good. Yes, very good. And you would know it on a question stem. You would see that and know what it is. Good. So pheochromocytoma, we have episodes. Episodes, meaning it comes and it goes of all of these symptoms because we are secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood supply. Okay? Good. Uh, last thing I want to say quickly about pheochromocytoma. Uh, when it comes to treating this, we can give alpha blockers, we can give beta blockers. Which one would you want to give first, an alpha blocker or a beta blocker? So, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, all I was going to say is that, uh, you know, when you have a tumor in the adrenal medulla, you want to take it out. However, before you take it out, you have to make sure your patient is optimized. Your patient is ready for surgery. And so, you don't want to risk, you know, having all of these, ep uh, you know, epinephrine and norepinephrine in the blood because that can really mess with the anesthesia your patient's under and all these things. So, you have to give an alpha blocker, you have to give a beta blocker. Um, I want you to think about when you bind alpha receptors, what does that do? When you bind beta receptors, what does that do? And then what order would you like to do this in? Not sure? It's okay if you're not sure. So, so let's, let's, let's think about it this way. When it comes to blood vessels, we have alpha receptors and we have beta receptors. If you bind an alpha receptor, this is going to cause vasoconstriction. I almost wrote dilation because you told me that. Constriction. I did. I, I'm, I'm very gullible sometimes. Mm -hmm. So alpha causes constriction. Beta is dilation. Okay. However, when you have lots of epinephrine in the blood, epinephrine tends to bind alpha more than beta, okay? And so, I ask you once again, do you want to do your alpha blocking first or your beta blocking first? Yes, very good. You want to block your alpha first, then you can block your beta. And the reason is because if you block only beta, that means all of the epi is going to be binding to alpha. Your, your patient's blood pressure is going to be about 200 million over 600 million. And um, that's not a good blood pressure to have. So block alpha first, then block beta, then you can go to surgery. Great. And so you can see here, short-term stress uh, triggers the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will send some nerve impulses down these fibers that will trigger release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, giving you all the things you're used to hearing about for those two. Uh, Long-term stress, like when you're studying for step one, what you see is cortisol is going to be the primary hormone, okay? So you get the long-term stress response from cortisol. Proteins and fats broken down, increased blood glucose, suppression of immune system, uh, you get a buffalo hump when you're studying for step one. All of these things, you can probably still see mine. Um, all of these things you should expect with long-term stress. Okay? Great. So another uh, endocrine gland that we didn't mention yet is something called the pineal gland. The pineal gland is so much fun. All it does is secrete melatonin. Melatonin uh, is really responsible for day and night cycles. And so melatonin gets really high about seven or eight o'clock at night, uh, you know, right in the middle of our lessons usually. Uh, and melatonin is 
<laughs> yeah, you're feeling it a little bit right now. <laughs> uh, so melatonin is going to cause you to start to feel sleepy and help you, once you fall asleep, to stay asleep. That's the whole idea with melatonin, okay? It can also, uh, you know, the timing of sexual maturation and puberty, a little bit less so. Um, okay, and so that's what the pineal gland is for. It secretes melatonin. Next is the pancreas. Pancreas is somewhat important, I think. Uh, but we talked a bit about pancreas a little bit already during our uh, GI lectures. We said that there is an exocrine function, meaning parts that create enzymes. Then there's endocrine with our islets of Langerhans. It's only 2% of the whole pancreas. However, it's a pretty important 2%. Our alpha cells produce glucagon. Beta cells produce insulin. Effects of glucagon is to raise the blood glucose. Glycogenolysis, breakdown of glycogen into glucose. Gluconeogenesis, synthesis of glucose from lactic acid, from non-carbohydrates, pyruvate. Anything you can turn into pyruvate can be turned into glucose via gluconeogenesis. So that's pretty handy. And then releasing that glucose into the blood. That is the effects of glucagon. And so this is our whole break down, get glucose available so that we can fight or flight. Insulin, we said, is our rest and digest hormone. This is going to lower our blood glucose. It's going to cause us to build, it inhibits glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, and it starts uh, glycogen synthesis. Okay, we're going to synthesize glycogen so we have a nice storage of glycogen if we need glucose down the road. Okay. So how does insulin produce its action? This is something get, that gets asked about, so I'm gonna put a star here. It activates a tyrosine kinase enzyme receptor, uh, and we said that usually these receptors come in twos. Here's our cell membrane. This is the receptor. Here's our little insulin hormone. Insulin comes and binds a receptor. That activates this tyrosine kinase. We have an insulin that binds to this receptor, and that activates this tyrosine kinase, and then these both start phosphorylating one another. Once they're good and phosphorylated, that will trigger a cascade. Okay. And so the story with insulin, it starts out as pro-insulin. And you can see here's our pro-insulin molecule. What ends up happening is we get cleavage of this pro-insulin molecule. And inside of a vesicle, we have our final insulin which is two lines of proteins connected by disulfide bonds, disulfide, meaning two sulfur molecules, disulfide. And inside of this vesicle, we also have C-peptide. So anytime we have release of insulin, we also have release of C-peptide. And so when you're thinking about uh, a patient who is hypoglycemic, they have low levels of blood glucose, you're worried about type 1 diabetes, you also want to check C-peptide. The reason is because this could be a patient that has uh, type 1 diabetes, autoimmune destruction of their pancreas, causing them to not be able to create insulin. Or you could have a healthcare provider who is getting insulin, injecting it into themselves, and getting low blood glucose. If you inject insulin into yourself, you will not have C-peptide. So, a lot of times when they give you this question, and have you seen questions like this, Natalia, where they give you someone with low blood glucose and they happen to have an uncle who has diabetes? No? Well, you may see this question. They will say, okay, you, a patient comes in who's a nurse. A patient comes in who has a family member with diabetes. They are presenting with um, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. And how do you determine what is the cause? The answer is C-peptide. If C-peptide is low, uh, this means that they may be injecting themselves with insulin. Okay. Great. So... Yeah, I think I think it's to lose weight. Some some people like um, like being in the hospital. Some people like being taken care of. Um, it's called a factitious syndrome. 
um, which you can read about in the psychology part in your first aid book. It's called factitious syndrome. And, and people will go and do some strange things just to be patients. They love being patients. They love having their meals brought to them and having people worried about them. They have some sort of psych issue um, that caused them to do that. And so they will do that with insulin. The other thing that they will do is that they will rub like um, dirty things under their skin and then give themselves lots of infections and then keep coming into the hospital. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, very bizarre. So uh, this is another thing that uh, is pretty important. So here we're looking at a beta cell in the pancreas. And what we see is we have glucose that enters via this transporter, GLUT2. The GLUT2 transporter takes up some glucose. We have glucokinase. Glucokinase turns that glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. That glucose 6-phosphate will go through glycolysis. That's what's being shown here with oxidation. Glucose 6-phosphate goes through glycolysis, and the ultimate product of glycolysis is ATP. When ATP gets high inside of a beta cell, what happens is it closes a potassium channel. This is so, so important. This is so, so important that I'm actually going to repeat it when we meet again on Thursday. High ATP in a beta cell closes a potassium channel. If you close a potassium channel, that's going to cause a depolarization just like anywhere else in the body. Depolarization will allow calcium channels to open. Calcium channels will allow all of these vesicles that are filled with insulin to, to fuse with the surface, be released in the bloodstream, and have um, you know, all of the effects that insulin has down, down the road. Okay, and so I'm just going to repeat that one more time. Uh, we have a nice big meal. We had some Skittles. We had some um, Coca-Cola, not Diet Coke, but regular Coke. And we had a cherry-flavored lollipop. We ate all of those things. So what happens? Glucose goes up in our bloodstream. That glucose is going to pass through a receptor. This is a beta cell in our pancreas, passes through. We have glucose now inside of our cell. Glucokinase is an enzyme that will convert it to glucose 6-phosphate. Glycolysis happens. The goal of glycolysis is to create ATP. As soon as we get ATP, Natalia, what happens? Good. Excellent. Potassium channel closes. That causes a depolarization. The depolarization allows a calcium channel to open. Calcium channel will then allow these vesicles filled with insulin to go into the bloodstream and live happily ever after. Okay? Very good. So, uh, one important thing to know, especially when it comes to treating your patients with diabetes, is that, um, yes, we need to manage their insulin levels, but we also need to encourage them to exercise. The reason that we encourage patients with diabetes to exercise, especially to do um, strength exercises, is that when you exercise, your muscle will increase the numbers of channels without any insulin needed at all. You look at this insulin receptor. There is nothing bound to this, and these glute transport proteins are going to bind here and absorb glucose just because you're working out. Just because you're working out. Okay? That's the beautiful thing about exercise. It does the same thing as insulin when you talk about muscles. So for our diabetic patients, especially type 2 diabetes, get them on a treadmill. Okay, And uh, that is going to help lowering their blood glucose and help with their symptoms. Okay? Great. Uh, in terms of all of these different transporters, um, uh, you know, there's a few that we need to know. Your first aid book is going to have all of this. It's going to have a chart kind of like this, but it's even uh, prettier. It's a very nice chart, and it has all of our transporters. So let's talk about them quickly here. So our GLUT1 transporter, this, this is present in most cells of our body, and it helps with the basal glucose uptake. Uh, insulin's not really required for it. It just uh, is always sort of there taking up glucose. But we can't change the activity of it. GLUT2 the most important thing about GLUT2 is I want you to remember two is for two directions. It allows glucose to come in 
it allows glucose to go out. And so uh, cells that should allow glucose to go out are things like the liver. The liver stores glucose. And so when it's time to release that glucose, you want to have a transporter that's able to release glucose. Beta cells of the pancreas, hypothalamus, and the basal lateral membrane of the small intestine, we want to be able to absorb glucose there as well. Um, uh, so that has glucose that's coming from our GI tract, from our diet, and those cells also may not have any glucose coming in, so they need to get glucose from the bloodstream. And so it's helpful to have a GLUT2 transporter. GLUT3 is present on the neurons, placenta, testes, and brain. GLUT4, uh, skeletal, cardiac muscle, fat. This is a very important one. It's increased activity by insulin. And so GLUT4 and GLUT2 are probably the most important ones. And um, GLUT5 is for fructose. And so with fructose, you're really thinking about small intestine, the sperm, the way that they're able to swim. They actually use fructose for energy rather than using glucose. Uh, so fun fact about sperm, they use fructose. Uh, and so that is what GLUT5 is for, is for those little spermies, okay? So GLUT2 is most important, GLUT4 also very important, but uh, it may be helpful to learn these other ones too so you can rule them out in a question stem. Okay, any questions on this? No, great. Okay, and so we can kind of see the balance here between um, our storage, our insulin, which is our storage and our glucagon, which is our breakdown, we want to make sure it's always at a normal balance. Okay, And so uh, for insulin release, obviously elevated blood glucose is the primary stimulus, rising levels of proteins, fatty acids, uh, release of acetylcholine from the parasympathetic system. Keep that in mind that there is some vagal stimulation going on there. Uh, and uh, glucagon, epinephrine, growth hormone, thyroxine, glucocorticoids, a somatostatin and a sympathetic will decrease levels of insulin. Okay. Great. And so uh, we're going to stop here for today. Uh, when we meet on Thursday, we have just a few more slides here, very close to the end, and then we have a few questions to do together, which I'm looking forward to doing together. I know you're going to get them all right, so I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And. Um, uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you, Natalia, before I let you go for today. Um, are you working on any QBanks right now? Okay. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I understand. I understand. Uh, when are you flying to Columbia? Wednesday? Okay, great. Well, have a safe flight back, and um, um, I look forward to meeting you at that time, on uh, same time on Thursday, and, and yeah, that's about it. So, uh, safe flight. <laughs> okay, no problem, no problem. You're working hard. You're doing good. You're doing a good job. Okay, you you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, and having that focus time will definitely be beneficial. Yeah. Okay, Natalia. Safe travels, and I will see you on Thursday, okay? You're welcome. Take care.